That's right. Ah, welcome. Oh. <laughs> Christopher's been with us, so we were just catching up over lunch and some of the other uh, talks here. And so it's, I'm really, really uh, grateful for you to come all the way from Paris to have some time with us together. And I was thinking about this, and you're probably the most uh, unknown, mysterious man in the whole mindfulness in tech Christ. world. Yeah. And I'm wondering, is that intentional, that when people uh, think of Insight Timer, they don't necessarily think of you? Often when you think of a company, you think of a person, right? Like, oh, that's the mm. CEO or that's the founder of this. You seem to have created a massive community and kind of stayed somewhat behind the scenes and quiet. And so yeah, well, in, intentionally so. Um, you might spot I'm a little nervous. This is the first time I've ever spoken about Insight Timer publicly. Um, I did a couple of... Uh, <laughs> I did a few podcasts a couple of years ago, but I've just never really wanted the story to be about me. Um, I think Insight Timer kind of has a set of ideals that matter, mm -hmm. and I wanted to build a platform. My brother and I bought Insight Timer from someone else in 2014, but we wanted to build a platform that would create a place of value where people could go and sit and be quiet and contemplate in silence and stillness. Mm -hmm. Um, we made two decisions early on. One was that we wanted the platform to be free. This was very important to us. I hope we talk about that more. Um, and diverse. A lot of people talk about diversity now, and they try and retrofit it into their products, their branding, and all these sorts of things. And you can't retrofit diversity. I always say to my son, it's like, um, by the way, my son's in Paris watching live, so I just want to say hi. hi. <laughs> and my daughter, Lucille. Um, you can't retrofit community or diversity into anything. Mm -hmm. If you don't start with these as fundamental building blocks, I say to Otto, it's like putting wings on a whale. You know, it looks good, but it doesn't fly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's what people are trying to do now. And I think what we decided to do was right at the start, and people kind of were quite critical of us from an investment point of view, we decided that any teacher could upload any content onto our platform, any belief system. Mm -hmm. um, and early on, this was something that, you know, people like Carmen Headspace, for example, didn't do. They sanitized their products. They took out spirituality, and they took out religion, and they took out things that really fundamentally mattered to people because they wanted to get into organizations and companies. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that model. And we were like, well, we're not going to do that. We're going to give everyone with a voice a place to go and essentially not use that voice, but recognize it. Mm -hmm. um, and from a commercial point of view, you know, initially it wasn't, wasn't a great investment. <laughs> um, it because it's more of a library and it's less centered on a few people or a few No, because few practices. if you're giving away your product for free, uh, you don't make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> my brother and I, my brother's a meditation teacher, and we were like, how do we find a way for teachers to make money? You have to understand that back then, um, and still very much so to this day, a lot of people who do teach, who share knowledge, kind of have day jobs. Yeah, they have nurses sure. and doctors and mm -hmm. psychologists, and they go home at night, and they're passionate about this, mm -hmm. and they don't make an income. Mm -hmm. And my brother was one of those people, and we're like, how can we provide educators with the ability to kind of earn an income without it becoming toxic. Mm -hmm. um, if any of you know meditation teachers, there's always that moment when you learn something or a teacher and then they're like, they're trying to get the money from you and they don't mm -hmm. want to talk about it. And I was like, well, if we can build a platform where the teachers can teach and we can arrange some kind of infrastructure and model where we can, we can bring the community and we can provide them with an income, mm -hmm. um, it felt very harmonious to mm -hmm. me. And so the worst thing I could do at that point was go and talk about myself. And I watch CEOs in our space who talk about themselves <laughs> and who talk about how much money their company makes and they compete in the New York Times. We make more money. And it just makes me sick. It really does. Um, and thank you. Um, and of course, what's happening now actually is Insight Time is slowly becoming profitable. Wow. And it took us 10 years to get there. We'll be profitable next year. And we did this, by the way, we did this by adopting a, a model of generosity. We decided that the more we gave away for free, 
the more the universe would kind of reciprocate in return. We've got two and a half million people on our app every week. One in 10 pay for our, we have 250,000 subscribers. Most CEOs don't talk about numbers and stuff. I don't care, I, I tell everyone because it means that there's no, there's no kind of secrets. We've got quarter of a million subscribers. We have two and a half million people on the app every week. That number's much bigger if you look at monthly actives. Um, and we share half of our income with our teachers. It's 50-50 right down the middle. Um, you spend a dollar on a subscription with Insight Timer. Apple takes a third. We'll talk about greed later. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we do talk about that. Um, Apple takes a third. I'll say it again. Apple takes a third. <laughs> um, and we share half of the teacher, right? And I'm just so proud of our team that we stuck in there and stuck with it and stuck with this model of value and value-based models and that we're profitable next year. That's amazing, that's amazing. Um, and so what do you think made you say yes, the, the man behind the curtain? Uh, what well, you're made? asking for a compliment, right? Why, <laughs> like, you know, why did I agree to talk today? And what's, yeah, and do you have a vision that you wanna share moving forward? I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like there's been, you've kind of stuck with your values, you stuck with your approach, mm. and it sounds like the, not, the community kinda has grown along with you. Mm. And now you're at an inf interesting, feels like a, a, a new, potential chapters arising where there's a potential to grow actually even more. Mm. And how do you do that in a way that keeps your values intact and, and what role do you want to play? So I think we've built a model that sustains itself through growth. A lot of companies don't do that. Most companies don't do that. Power and models corrupt themselves. Um, and there are a million companies that we can point to in the social networking space. I hope we talk about that. We don't have enough time today. Um, our model scales. It's a generosity model. The more people that come to our platform, the more people get treated for mental health and well-being for free. The more one in 10 people who pay us, the more teachers make money. So this thing, no matter how big it gets, stays true to its values. And very few companies can say that, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I'm troubled here today because I don't want the story, I have never wanted to be a public person. I don't want the story to be about me. I want it to be about our teachers and our platform. Um, I want it to be about this kind of, you know, I call Insight Time of the mothership of kind of conscious um, enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, Value-based, generosity-based company. Um, but the problem is, I keep reading that, um, putting aside all of the stuff that's making me terrified about AI and those sorts of things, I keep reading that good storytellers kind of win and a, a, a bad product with a good narrator mm -hmm. beats a good product with a bad narrator and there's nothing worse than a narrator who doesn't speak. Um, and so my kind of hand is forced really, I begrudgingly talk. <laughs> okay. um, He's begrudgingly talking. Um, and the other <laughs> You're thing doing is, a pretty good job, I have to yeah, say. Yeah, so you far, can so tell okay. I'm nervous, I'm like I've got a dry mouth, but... <laughs> the, that vodka will help. <laughs> it's just water, it's water, it's water. Um, the other thing is, you know, there's just so much stuff going on that needs to be talked about. And it, yeah. you know, it angers me and... Um, it's, things get to a point in life at my age where it kind of becomes more difficult to be silent than to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was listening to, I'm an Aussie, so I don't, I forget her name, the first lady of California. Uh, um, first partner of California, Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Excuse me? Jennifer. Jennifer. I'm going to call her Jen. Siebel right, no, call her Jennifer. Jen. Call her Jen. Um, and I was sitting down there listening to her and thinking, this is, this is exactly how I feel. Mm. And funnily enough, she's my age. I looked, I, I wikipedia her while she was talking. <laughs> <laughs> Put your phones down. Mindfully. Um, no, because I was just so moved by her. But I noticed something. I do it too, as a parent. She's like, she would talk about her kids um, using technology and she kept saying, I know it's my fault. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, Gosh, I feel sorry for you because it's not your fault, mm. right? It is not your fault as a parent. The guilt, you know, in Australia, you can't advertise sugar breakfast cereal to kids at 4 p.m. because pester power kind of just is exhausting, mm. right? Um, it is a fact, and we need to talk about it. It is a fact that there are 
lots of people, very powerful people running very powerful tech companies that know these products are toxic for our kids, are causing kids to commit suicide, make it impossible to parent, and they keep doing it. And no one gets up here and says, these guys have to be held accountable. Yeah, yeah. And I was speaking to someone who I respect very much, Charlie Hartwell, who's someone in the audience, saying, I want to name names. I'm sick of kind of just um, <sighs> saying we've got to hold people accountable. Right, the right, problem right. is you can't hold people accountable unless you say who they are. Now, I'm not going to do that to you, Soren, because you know you can know if you're, you can <laughs> You all know who I they are. I might not say names, you know, but you're welcome to say I, I don't want to become the poster child for bashing people up. But the thing is, you know, um, there are things that Mark Zuckerberg knew and continue to do yeah. that are harming kids. Now, in any definition around the world, that's a criminal act. And I'm the one who sits at home with my kids feeling guilty that I can't take the iPad away. If I give the iPad to them, I feel guilty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get like the first partner of California sitting here with tears in her eyes saying, I know it's my fault. And it's like, yeah. Fuck, it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. um, and we need um, people of a certain age, you get to a certain age in life where you think, oh, look, I just I don't fucking care anymore. <laughs> you don't care about your reputation anymore. They just are willing to talk. And so here I am, I'm talking, because yeah. someone needs to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, well, let's talk about, what do, you, what do you think is that the key to that um, challenge? Of the, is it the algorithms? If, if, let's say, Mark Zuckerberg quits tomorrow, there's 10 people that would fulfill his place. Let's say Meta goes out of business tomorrow. There's 100 more companies that would totally be welcome to take that place, right? Mm. And the board is like, you're not going to reduce, you're not going to change your algorithm because our stock is going to go south. Yeah, so and we so can have lots of pressure. There's a system, yeah. right? It's yeah. not a, per a, a person can be, have some impact, but if that person changes, the board can easily get rid of them a new person arises. So where do you think is the, the, the point? Well, this of course is not true when it comes to Facebook and Google. Facebook There's and Google, very few of them, right? Three there. people on this planet control Facebook and Google. Mark Zuckerberg, Larry, and Sergey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they can, you're right, they can do as they wish. They rare, do it. That's they, a rare they, situation. They, they do as they wish. Yeah. It's a very right. rare situation, though. And I'm not saying, oh, maybe I am. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was going to say, I'm not saying they're bad people. <laughs> um, the thing is, you can have multiple conversations about this at different levels, yeah. right? You can talk about capitalism and, and um, democracy, and people say these systems don't work. I, I'm, I'm a, I believe they do work. I believe that we don't have the tools in place to enforce the systems, mm -hmm. right? The problem with capitalism is not that people can get ahead and try. The problem is that we don't enforce tax policy and we don't collect the bloody money right. to, pay, um, to pay for the model. So yeah. we want all the trappings of capitalism, but then every time it comes to paying the tax, yeah. we don't pay it. Um, or like Donald Trump pays almost nothing in taxes. I can't talk about so. him. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Either you don't pay it or you get out because the rich make the but, laws. But let's talk about something else, right? Let's talk about, let, let's, <laughs> let's talk about Apple. Let's talk about Apple. Let's pick another big foe. I'm not going to have any hate mail when I get home, but um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of Apple in terms of some of its products. Mm -hmm. um, go to Apple's website and check down in the footer, and it talks about its values. Right, it's got seven of them, I think. Um, it's got obvious ones, privacy and whatever. Um, and then it talks about environment. Mm -hmm. It talks about um, equality, inclusion, diversity, supply chain. These are Apple's values. And they're good values. They're important. Um, what's interesting when Apple talks about these values is in every single instance, it says, we don't just stop at what we're obligated to do, we go further. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. So we don't just look at our supply chain here in the US, we go to wherever it is, and we look at their supply chains mm -hmm. and their supply chains. When it comes to the environment, we don't, um, we don't just look at our laptops, we look at the electricity that runs the laptops, we buy forests. We go further than what's obligated. 
of us by law. Now, you ask Apple about tax and paying their fair share of tax. We do everything according to the law, right? Where's the leadership in tax? The problem with kind of these models is that most of the values that Apple has are caused by the fact that the companies don't pay their fair share of tax. If you didn't have a tax problem, we could pay teachers mm -hmm. double their salary. We could fix the health system. We could fix the education system. Yeah, sure. The problem is, oh shit, sorry. The problem is we don't have enough money. Um, and so you end up kind of with these systems that work, but you asked me what the problem is. The problem is greed. Okay. That's yeah. the problem. Um, greed is kind of the common denominator for everything that, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing wrong with wealth, by the way. I hope, just to be clear, I'm not some AI, I hope Insight Timer becomes the biggest and most successful, profitable company <laughs> on the planet. I really do. I aspire to building a successful business. I'm a capitalist. But I know that my model says that if I've achieved that, right, millions and millions and millions of people will have had free mental health care and well-being. Teachers will have made an equal sum of money, mm -hmm. and we will have made a profit. Profit is not a dirty word. What happens to profit is it turns into greed. If you share your profit, if wealth is shared, it becomes an enormously powerful tool. The problem is you've got a thousand billionaires in this country yep. who pay 8% tax. I'm sorry to talk about tax. I know it's really no, boring, right. but the it's thing is, live. Um, you asked me what the problem is. Yeah. Um, the problem is the models work, but, but we don't enforce the rules. And the reason why we don't enforce the rules is because the people in power put lobbyists in Washington yeah, yeah, and yeah, they yeah. make the rules. Yeah. Um, right. yeah. Um, and I'm not a socialist. I'm not a, like, I don't even understand it all, right? I believe in capitalism. <laughs> um, the, the concern I have now, um, first time in my life in the last three months is I've become disassociated actually i've kind of i think this is the real reason why i decided to talk because like i i look at ai um and i've watched lots of videos and interviews about people talking about it and i think um and i've got two kids that are going to have to deal with the consequences and finally we've got a discovery that's kind of the nuclear bomb, right? But it's you mean the the AI? Uh, yeah, call it what you want. Generative got the uh, artificial general intelligence. Yeah, um, computers are teaching themselves and learning. Yeah, and um, what's happening? The narrative around AI now is the following. Um, again, AI is controlled by, and they will disagree with you, by the way, but. Don't believe it. <laughs> AI is controlled really by five or six people. It's controlled by the people that own Facebook and Google and OpenAI and um, mostly speaking, of course. If that group of people got in a room together and said, we're going to slow the implementation of this technology, they could. In the US, potentially, yeah. Well, so the counter argument is we don't do it, that the Chinese will. And of course, a lot of commentators are now saying, if you're trying to control a billion people, the last thing you want is AI running around controlling you, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but it, but it, it can't be the argument. Um, um, I, get, I get very worried when a smaller group of people, especially if you look at the history, right? This is the first time in history where a technological advancement, I'm not talking about AI, by the way, I'm just talking about the internet and social media, where our well-being has reduced, where technology actually is not good for us. Think about that. It's the first time in history where we've invented something for our well-being and actually our quality of life. My kids are less happy. Are you talking about social media? Yeah, I'm talking about social media. The combination of Facebook and the iPhone is a disaster. Mm -hmm. I really mean that, an absolute disaster. And if it was up to me, I would turn it all off tomorrow. I literally, I would flick the switch on the whole thing. I remember when I was seven or eight, nine, ten, my brother Simon, who I think is watching from Sydney, my twin, hi Simon. <laughs> um, we would go and build cubby houses, and I'm not yeah. trying to romanticize the past. Someone earlier on said we romanticize the past. It's not, it's not the case that we romanticize the past. I'm just terrified about what happens in the future. And if you look at what's happened in the past, um, in the recent past, 
we've trusted a smaller group of technologists to make the right decisions, and they haven't. Mm -hmm. And here we are again, right? <laughs> this time they don't have a social network, they've got a bomb that's ticking, and they're saying, trust us. And my question is, do you? Do you trust them? I'm not saying, I'm not saying, yes I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying don't trust them, no, but... They have, they, have to prove that, <laughs> they have to prove they're trustworthy. And they haven't. And the only way you can prove if someone's trustworthy is you've got to kind of interrogate. But do you, do you see a role for government in all this? Is the government just sitting back and hoping everything works uh, out? I'm or do so, they step in? You well, the problem is they've stacked the government. And I don't mean to be, you know, doom and gloom here. Maybe. But... Um, <laughs> Yes, I absolutely do. I'm not saying government's the best system here, but I sure as hell know that five white guys in a room with a trillion dollars are not going to make decisions on behalf of what happens to my daughter in 50 years' time because I don't trust them. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> my concern is, this is the current narrative around AI. The owners of the AI are saying to us, we don't trust you with the technology, we're not going to release it, and I'm glad they're saying that. It's dangerous. And they're saying this technology should not be released to the general public. Good. However, we want you to trust us with it. Yeah. Think about that, right? We're not going to trust you with it, it's too dangerous, but can you trust us with that? And I'm like, well, I don't know. And so in order to decide if someone's trustworthy, you've got to listen to what they're saying. I've been listening to a bunch of these people for the last couple of months talking about AI. Um, and there's kind of two claims that let's, and, uh, you know, you have a gentleman speaking tomorrow, Sam. Yeah. I think he's a very admirable guy. I like a lot of the things that he says. But he controls the narrative around AI, Sam Altman, and Jack Corn will be interviewing him tomorrow. And the conversation is going to be mostly, I suspect, around is it going to affect consciousness and all that sort of stuff, and that's great. I'll be part of the conversation. But I wouldn't, we'll I like, don't even listen to all that stuff, right? The question is, who's sitting in the room when something goes wrong, and who has the authority to turn this off if something goes wrong, right? The, the, prob the, the good thing about government is you have chain of command. With military, you know, you know at least that there are elected officials in there making decisions. I'm not saying they make the right decisions. Right, right, right but there's structure and there's methodology. And twice Sam was asked two questions which I thought were very interesting um, in an interview. One was about power and one was about money. And twice I thought he didn't answer the question. And if I'm trying to establish trustworthiness, mm -hmm. I want a very simple, concise answer to a very simple question. And the question was, well, who's, who's kind of in charge? And Sam's answer was, well, I don't have any special control. It's like, well, that's a half answer, right? Who has control? And Sam said, well, there's, you know, maybe 10,000, 20,000 people that are going to make decisions. And the interviewer's like, no, no, no. There's like, there's three or four of you guys in a the room. Board of directors, make decisions yeah. on all, you know, who's in charge? I hope you're asking that question tomorrow. Who is in charge? I'm not saying that they have malicious intent, but I'm saying, do they have a right? The problem that we have at the moment is, but it's we, definitely, a, the, 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 you, the, the, the problem is you get these people who discover something and they think that the act of discovery confers on them the right to decide whether or not that discovery impacts on you all. And they're not ethicists, they're not philosophers, they're not educators. They're not regulators. I don't want some guy who's 35 years old who ran some tech company making a decision about a nuclear weapon. The second question this guy asked was, sorry, I'll get to the end, sorry, I'm, I'm waffling on. The second question they asked was, well, but, but money, greed. Um, and the answer to that question about open AI, that company is always, oh, well, we're, um, we're we're a, propped caf uh, propped caf we're a capped profit company. So when you hear that, you think, oh, okay. 
That's, that's good. It's, it's capped profit, so there can't be any financial, in, you know, that's what it means. At least that's what it infers. Well, he doesn't own equity in the company. Right. But so other people own equity in the company. So, how much do they own, right? Now, here's the thing. Who knows what the uh, capped number is in that company? How much money do you get back if you put a million bucks into OpenAI? It's between 7 and 10%, depending on... Or 7 it's 100, 100 times. 7% 7 to 100%, depending on when they came in. No, no, it's 100 times. No, it depends on when they came... Well, from right. the article that I read, it was 7% to 100%. So the interview that he gave... Um, uh, but what would you like to get your return? What would the investors that invested in your company early on? What return would you I like don't own a nuclear weapon. Like, I'm building a platform where we give away meditation, right? He's giving away a nuclear <laughs> bomb. Well, but, but there's, so, there's no, no, more. No, 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 no. But there's more to it than that. No, you know? there's not more to it than yeah, that. Yeah. So, for example, would you, would you, would you stop the AI that allows people to, to uh, search the microbiome to determine the cause of certain diseases that we've never been able to cause? <laughs> would you search the, Would you stop the AI that allows a, a computer system to read a to, to read an M M MRI scan and read it more effectively than? any other physician can do it so they can actually see what's going on in the system because it can run processes faster than the human? Would you stop the AI that allows for um, children to now go online and be able to, to um, read and get information that they were never able to get before because they all can't mm -hmm. afford private tutors like mm -hmm. everybody else can, so they actually get their own private tutors? Would you like take all that out? So let me answer that with a question. <laughs> Facebook's been telling us for years that it's great at connecting people. It's true. Um, just because some things do some good things doesn't mean it's worth it. Now, yeah, but they, I could say the, the same thing about any app, though. I could no, say, no, but I we're not. But not talking about an app. We're talking about a bomb. Yeah, but I could say, I could say this. I could say, listen, it's unethical to create an app because an app requires you to use your phone, and once you use your phone, you're constantly now addicted into this phone waste world, and it's unethical to actually create an app that requires people to look at their phone. Now, the I could make is that I argument. I know, but you, could, no, you but could say that's not a good argument, but I could make that argument. Well, I, I would disagree with it. Okay. <laughs> um, no, because I don't believe, like, there's implied choice in that, in that argument. There's no implied choice if a piece of AI comes through the window and starts killing everyone, right? The, the problem is what, what, what's happening at the moment with the commentary is we're talking about shopping models and room night models and, and apps and social network, and we're using analogies related to that with this other thing, mm -hmm. which is the capacity to end civilization as we know it. And I just don't want a bunch of, I don't want five people in a room making that decision on behalf of my kids. Would you rather a president like Trump make the decision? Who do you want to make the decision? I can't talk about him. I told you. Okay, already. sorry. <laughs> if um, somebody's making that decision, <laughs> the truth is yes. Actually. You'd rather Trump make that decision. Oh gosh. <laughs> Rewind. Cut that bit out. <laughs> Trump shouldn't arrange the alphabet. I mean, he honestly. <laughs> um, um, it's, okay. Do right, I we, believe in government more in terms of? Do I believe that regulation is better than commercial yeah, enterprise yeah, yeah, when it comes yeah. to safety? Yes. Yeah. Do I like the fact that planes are regulated before they fly? Yeah. Do I like the fact that we have the FDA, the FCC? Yes, I do. I think these institutions are important, and I think without them, things dismantle very but What quickly. about an AI? What about an institution that regulates AI? Bring it on. But the point, bring it on yeah, now, I'm right now. Yeah. But the point, is, um, the point is, everyone's saying, well, you know, like there was that letter that was put out. I don't know if you saw it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The letter was signed by 22,000 people. I was one of them that signed it a couple of months ago. 22,000 ethicists, educators, philosophers said, we're not saying AI is bad, but we're saying there's too much that we don't know. Just stop the release of new releases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if, you, if you do nothing else, just pause. And let's just take time to think. Now, nothing happens. And in fact, one of the people of those five dismissed that letter and said, look, it's a little bit silly, that letter, right? 22,000 people can't be silly about this, right? It's just that this is, this is bigger than new tech. This is biblical. Mm -hmm. I really mean that. Okay. This is... This is we're going to have to add on that. Or we've gone over, so we have to end on that. This is right. biblical. Any last? This is biblical, <laughs> this is man. Biblical, Inside man. timer. <laughs> this is biblical. All right, thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.